We'll call the uh, Subcommittee on Communications and Technology hearing to uh, order. Our hearing today is entitled, Broadband Stimulus, Is It Working? Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome our witnesses today for uh, this uh, hearing, uh, which will look at uh, all these issues related to how the stimulus money was spent on building out broadband. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fredoso, we, we appreciate you uh, being here today uh, from, let me get this right, President and CEO of MCNC. And uh, yeah. so we, we welcome you and look forward to your comments well, as well, sir. Thank you, Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Deget and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to present congressional uh, testimony regarding the successful implementation of broadband stimulus funds in North Carolina. I particularly want to thank Congresswoman Renee, Renee Elmers from MCNC's home state of North Carolina. She represents the great people of North Carolina's second district and is a champion of better health care, education, and access to te technology. Mr. Chairman, for over 25 years, the private nonprofit organization that I lead, MCNC, has operated North Carolina's fiber optic highway of innovation, the North Carolina Research and Education Network, or NCREN. While the roots of NCREN are in serving the vast research needs of the University of North Carolina system, the community of connectors to NCREN has grown the last several years to, to include connections to more than 450 community anchor institutions, including all of K through 20 public education, many private uh, universities, numerous nonprofit healthcare providers, and several state and federal research organizations. The anchor institutions that we serve require large amounts of low latency, high speed connectivity, and they're, collectively their demand for bandwidth doubles every two years. A couple of examples. Since 2011, the 58 community colleges we serve have reported a five-fold increase in bandwidth demand. And since 2007, our K-12 through public school districts have recorded a 20-fold in increase in bandwidth use. Students in our community colleges now directly uh, access and, ad and program advanced manufacturing equipment virtually over NCREN to get current skills needed in the workforce, while the colleges avoid having to spend precious capital purchasing these machines directly. MCNC also has a long history of cooperative work with our incumbent service providers, telephone membership cooperatives, electric membership cooperatives, and independent telecommunications companies in North Carolina. We spend about $9 million per year for local circuits and internet bandwidth with these providers. In 2007, in our, in our meetings with our private sector service provider partners, it became evident that NCREN's need for bandwidth, particularly in rural North Carolina, was going to outstrip the capacity of the existing middle mile fiber in the state. There was either no fiber available in certain sections of North Carolina or limited fiber capacity to meet the growing needs of the anchor institutions served by our network. We also found that these service providers, even supported by a proposed $8 million investment from MCNC, lacked a business case to build in the areas with no fiber or to add fiber capacity in underserved areas. To serve the needs of the students, healthcare providers, and research institutions connected to NCREN, MCNC made the decision to pursue <coughs> VTOP funds. For matching funds, we allocated $8 million from our capital refresh fund. We also raised $4 million from private sector wholesale service provider FRC. We raised $24 million from North Carolina's nonprofit Golden Leaf Foundation and $4 million in donated can conduit and land. MCNC brought a total of $40 million to the table in a vision for a statewide network that would bring broadband to some of the most rural, mountainous, and difficult areas to reach in the state. Leveraging these matching funds, MCNC applied for and won two rounds of BTOP funding, totaling $104 million. Today, MCNC is within 50 miles of completing a 2,600-mile middle-mile network. The network is comprised of 1,800 miles of new-build fiber and 800 miles of leased fiber. MCNC leased 800 miles of fiber from service providers, typically under 20-year terms. These leases are tangible demonstration of the solid relationships that we enjoy with our service provider partners and how MCNC was able to leverage local infrastructure into its statewide broadband network. The construction phase of the project has given a badly, infu a badly needed infusion of revenue to private sector companies. Our fi fiber and conduit supply company is Comscope. Comscope is headquartered in Hickory, North Carolina. When we chose Comscope as our supplier, their conduit plant was idled. During the height of our project, over a two-year period, they operated 24-7 with more than 100 workers to keep up with demand. Much of the BTOP fiber is already in use, benefiting the 450 community an anchor institutions served by NCREN and allowing us to serve 1,500 more community anchor institutions. The BTOP award will allow us to scale connectivity to these institutions to the multi-gigabit -giga level they demand 
as they need additional bandwidth. And our sustainability plan will allow this scalability to happen at today's cost. Also, MCNC is in discussions with more than 10 wholesale and last mile service providers interested in the new fiber build. Many are looking to enter areas previously unavailable to them. Rural broadband is migrating quickly from wired services like DSL to wireless services like WiMAX, Wi-Fi Mesh, and 4G LTE as last mile solutions. The commonality in all of these over the air last mile services is the need for fiber based backhaul and transport services. Mr. Chairman, our story is a great success story. It's based on leveraging privately raised matching funds, utilizing existing local infrastructure, and attracting BTOP federal investment to build a digital highway that directly supports innovative research, idea formation, equity of access to education, better health care outcomes for North Carolinians, and also supports the private sector as they look to put new wireless services into rural areas of the state. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panelists for your testimony. Mr. Fernoso, thank you for especially for yours here at the end. Uh, but, you know, the whole point is we're trying to get broadband to everybody, right, Mr. Abraham? We're trying to get, we're trying, I mean, it doesn't help you if you have the last mile if you don't have the middle. <laughs> you need it all, right? And also you too, Mr. Ferdoso, right? Right, Mr. Gett. I, I, think, I think the leap we have to take here is that um, you're, you're looking at a critical infrastructure now. So you've got to look at it from both perspectives. The last mile in a lot of rural areas is going to move towards wireless. Right. Wireless needs to find fiber as quickly as possible for backhaul traffic. Right. Our providers in North Carolina have, have told us that their deployments into rural areas like some of the eastern parts of the state that Congresswoman Elmers represents is going to be 4G LTE or WiMAX or Wi-Fi. Um, there is not enough middle mile fiber right now along specific routes in the area. We did this verification because we were trying to serve schools right. to take that backhaul traffic. Okay. The yep. second piece of this is that it's critical infrastructure. Yeah, right. You and, and you're not going to run a hospital that you're putting on health care mm -hmm. information exchange or, or, uh, uh, elect or telehealth on one single fiber connection to that hospital, right. and that's what the middle mile serves directly. Right. So it you need multiple paths. Uh, Mr. Abraham and Mr. Uh, Fredoso, uh, we've heard the argument from some of the incumbent broadband providers that there's no need for, there was no need for Recovery Act funding. Uh, they can't compete with networks funded in part with public dollars, uh, and BTOP recipients are overbuilding their networks. What's been your experience with getting private investment for the deployment of broadband in your communities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Welch. Um, I think an important fact to note is that we're a private nonprofit and we've been operating this network for 25 years. So we've built really good relationships with our private sector service providers in North Carolina. We had similar discussions to what Mr. Abraham uh, uh, had, had w in Georgia. But let me give you one example. We had to upgrade one route, one connection between Rocky Mount and Greenville. Part of it touches Congresswoman Elmer's district. And we got a, a quote of 5x the price for two times the bandwidth. And the reason was is that we lacked fiber availability. The carrier lacked fiber availability. So we took it upon ourselves to partner with them, figure out where they had availability, lease from them as part of the BTOP program, but then build in the gaps in the state so we could serve these anchor institutions. And uh, we serve all of K through 20 public education. Their need is growing greatly. Um, but this also now offers North Carolina an opportunity to be a test bed for some of these wireless technologies in the last mile. Work with these private sector service providers to make fiber available to them on, a, on attractive terms to allow them to deploy these services in areas that they couldn't reach before. So our story is a little bit different. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it, I don't know Colorado, I don't know Vermont, but uh, I know that we did the diligence up front to make certain that um, that the overbuild was kept to a minimum to interconnect points. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my question uh, is for Mr. Fredoso, and I'm, I've been listening carefully to your testimony, um, especially my questioning is al along the line of, of my, my colleagues as well in relation to um, the overbuilding and the, you know, the, the, the comments and, and, you know, the, the opinion from the private sector that, that the um, uh, middle mile network has been overbuilt. 
Um, so basically you, you just gave us information that you built a very strong relationship with, with the private sector. So are you experiencing this? Because of course, you know, many in their opinion, you know, with, with government subsidized entities that, you know, there's an availability there to, to, to pick lucrative places and serve rather than uh, build the underserved areas. You know, I would agree with with Mr. Smith and Mr. Kirchhoff. Um, uh, there has to be some regional assessment, uh, Congresswoman Elmers, of what's available in those areas. I believe that we're entering a time, particularly for rural economic development and for rural health care, that uh, more than one path of fiber is going to be needed into some rural communities. Mm -hmm. You're very familiar, obviously, with the health care industry being a nurse. Um, as we move more into telehealth for critical areas, from Viden um, that touches part of, uh, of your district or, and the health care providers that work, um, if we're doing telehealth over these connections, I wouldn't want one route of fiber into that hospital. Mm -hmm. If we're delivering health care based on these connections, it would be like saying I have one road in and out of the hospital and it's blocked by a car wreck, mm -hmm. I can't get to the hospital. If I have one path of fiber to a hospital and that gets cut, I don't want health care to stop in that hospital. Mm -hmm. I don't want health care so to effectively stop. So you've got to be smart about those right. things. Right. So what, I, what I'm hearing you saying is that, um, that although some may view overbuild as one uh, in one vision, there may also be an, a need for yeah, exactly. additional. Exactly. Now, you're, you're familiar with the parts of the state. One more example, and I'm sure. sorry. But you're familiar with the parts of the state in Rutherfordton and Shelby mm -hmm. that have attracted a lot of data centers. Facebook is not going to build a data center in, in Rutherfordton, North Carolina, unless they have three or four, four paths of fiber alternatives there. If, if, they, if they get one fiber cut and their data goes down from that data center, it costs them literally millions of dollars. They could build their own fiber and justify that based on the return on investment. So it's got to be a regional approach. You've got to look at what the economic drivers and what the education drivers are in those regions mm -hmm. and understand what the infrastructure is needed to serve those. Mm -hmm. And you do agree that you know, the underserved areas should definitely be a focus, though. Well. Absolutely. And, and y we had a requirement of the grant that we had to terminate at least one endpoint on every segment that we built in an underserved area. Mm -hmm. And we've done that in, in North Carolina through the implementation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kirchhoff, would, would you agree with, with some of the uh, comments that Mr. Verdoso has made uh, in relation, of course, to your, your geographical area? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Y yes, I would. And, I, I, and I'm sitting here thinking that's the model. <laughs> that I wish we could have used in, in Colorado, to be quite frankly, because it sounds like it's working very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, now, Mr. Verdoso, along, along this um, line of thinking, I know that in your testimony you point out that you're 50 miles from completing the 2,600 uh, middle mile network. Where are you now with um, subsidized funding? Are you are you up and running and sustainable? Oh yeah, we've we've operated the network as you know, Congresswoman, for 25 years mm -hmm. with the with the community anchor institutions as our uh, as our uh, uh, key constituents on the network. We can operate the network with those financially and fiscally with those endpoints on the network and keep prices relatively flat. We are depending on interest in the fiber strands for commercial use in rural parts of the state, and we're seeing strong demand for those. Okay. So, for example, wholesalers are coming to us and wanting to buy fiber to um, uh, uh, supply a data center, or they're wanting to buy fiber to the tower in rural areas to deploy 4G LTE services, mm -hmm. enhancing the broadband offerings in those areas. Mm -hmm. So it is a large part of our sustainability plan to close those deals, but we feel, feel very confident we'll be able to have a sustainable model for the long term serve those education and healthcare institutions that we serve. So in your opinion, I have about 10 seconds left. Um, you will or will not need ad additional um, uh, federal funds? Uh, we will not need additional federal funds. Okay. Thank you, sir. And I uh, yield back the remainder of my time. Gentlelady yields back at this time, seeing no more uh, questions. I want to thank the panelists, the witnesses. Before, before you from up, Colorado. I'd ask unanimous consent to um, uh, put into the record uh, some more letters that I was just handed regarding this Eagle Net situation. I think they complete the record. Yeah, but without objection. Uh, and the members will have 10 days to submit the, uh, additional items for the record. And I uh, want to thank the witnesses for being here today. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>